Hello, I'm Bill Leopold, and welcome to this edition of Breakfast at the Barracks. Joining me is Nicole Fleetwood, Assistant Professor of American Studies at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Nicole, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. Um, I want to jump right in and talk about the research that you've done before, before okay. we jump into your new book. Sounds good. Um, in your old research, well, I shouldn't say your old research, in your recent research, you've been talking a lot about youth, mm -hmm. race, public transportation, and the conversation of how they kind of all interconnect in lots of different ways. Um, and also into that is some media, when you, were in, when you talked about a San Francisco project. Can you give us, our viewers, a little overview of kind of your past research and kind of what you were studying and kind of what you were doing? I'd love to. Um, well, my former, re my research that led me to Rutgers. Um, started when I was at Stanford in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I actually started before then. I was an elementary school teacher and I was very interested in what my students did once they left school. Okay. You know, and I, many of my students ended up in trouble. Um, the school district was in a very poor neighborhood and a lot of students would end up going to the bodega after um, school and then the bodega would lead to a fight and they'd end up in juvenile um, justice system. Mm -hmm. and so I wanted to figure out this kind of relationship between young people, public space, media representation, especially of youth of color. Mm -hmm. um, so I started doing a series of ethnographic projects where one, the one that you mentioned about public trans transportation, I spent several months just riding the bus in San Francisco and Oakland okay. and observing the interactions specifically between youth of color and adults, uh, often white adults, um, in neighborhoods where these different groups intersected. And I looked at where people would sit on the bus, the type of interactions that were happening on the bus, if, if a conflict arose, how that conflict was addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote an, a couple of essays about that. Another um, ethnographic project I did around youth representation and public space was um, when I worked with a media arts organization with a group of young people to produce a documentary about their experience in San Francisco, mm -hmm. specifically around public housing, um, violence, um, and issues that we assume are related to kind of young people of color. Um, so we let them come up with their own storylines mm -hmm. and also, you know, they had to work with each other in terms of um, cr critique and conflict. How did they resolve conflict during the production process? And so I documented that, it, that, that process of, uh, of young people actually coming up with storylines about their authentic or their real experience and the kind of the contradictions and complexities around on what is kind of a real experience for young people of color, mm -hmm. and then how that um, that product, that documentary, um, circulates and gets read by a larger audience as somehow indicative of an experience of young people, or somehow false, or so just the different kinds of ways that we as an audience perceive young people, um, and in the ways in which they are represented in the media. Mm -hmm. What's interesting for me as I read through both mm -hmm. both of those articles was the conversation around the complexity of dominant culture and the perception of subordinate culture around folks of color, mm -hmm. youth, socioeconomic, and kind of the interaction between all those. Um, when you talk about the San Francisco, there was um, a woman named Maria who was trying to write a scenario about kind of who she would bring home to introduce to her parents and the complexity about what that meant for her to bring a, per a different person of color home who was outside of her own ethnicity and whether or not that was true to her and kind of that complexity for her in terms of what did it mean to have feelings towards this person? What did it mean? Was, it, was the representation real or not real? And so there was really this complexity in terms of even being an Asian, for her, an Asian American woman in terms of what that meant in terms of where she was going, what she was doing and how she was having that conversation with other folks who were of color who were not Asian. Right, and there was another student who struggled with Maria because she said, you know, from her experience, she doesn't see um, Asians and blacks dating. So right. she said, well, that's not a true representation of how youth kind of experience mm -hmm. relationship and youth interactions in San Francisco. And it became a really heated exchange um, that silenced one of, the, one of the members of the group in the end. Um, and uh, some, some, some frictions really started to arise around um, inter, in, interracial intimacy mm -hmm. and who, you know, and uh, whose story is most legitimate. So. Um, um, you know, we were trying to create a platform where everyone, every, all voices were legitimate and everyone had a chance to speak, but we also see that amongst um, young people, 
um, of color from different ethnicities and race that they don't necessarily share the same experience. Right. And often we um, conflate all youth of color and we assume that they have, you know, they're, they're coming from the same position and they have the same kind of understanding and perception and it's not true. You know, and they're also de dealing very with very different um, parental structures and kind of domestic situations, religious, political um, beliefs and the like. And, and you're very clear about San Francisco that some of it's regional, some of it's historical in terms of the context. You know, it's not the same in terms of Chicano, African American, Black, and Asian American experiences. And yes, while they're all folks of color, mm -hmm. that that complexity, that history in the San Francisco area is very different. And they have very different histories in terms of their conversation. And that's part of the complexity that you bring to that article that I really enjoyed. So, Thank you. Thank you. Um, your new book, it's coming out soon. Um, would you kind of give us an overview of your new book and kind of what you're writing about at this point? I would love to. Um, so my new book is called Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality, and Blackness, and it's coming out with the University of Chicago Press um, this fall, fall of, of, of 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and it in some ways continues um, some of the questions that I start in this earlier research around youth, race, and media. I'm very interested in really simple questions, and I'm, one of the simple questions I'm interested in is, how do we come to see what we see? One of the things that you had, one of the, um, of the overview of the book is a piece of work, a piece of artwork mm -hmm. that was displayed in, and the reactions to the artwork. So uh, can you give us some insight of kind of how you use that one particular artwork as a way and a point of reference in terms of the starting of the conversation? So in one chapter I talk about, one chapter is actually called Excess Flesh. Okay. So where I look at um, black women photographers and performers who take, uh, take what I say is a kind of over-determined representation of black women as excessive, as you know, overly performative, as embodied in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so they take up that dominant image and they actually do different things with it. They, they kind of destabilize that dominant representation by really taking it and hyper-visualizing uh, it. And so in this case, you're talking about Renee Cox, who yes. does a, a series of um, images. And she was actually in residence here at Rutgers last year, and her work was displayed at the Douglas um, Library, the uh, Mabel um, Library over on, on, the, on the Douglas campus, okay. and she gave several talks. But um, so Renee Cox is a very well-known photographer, and in much of her work, she poses her own body, and often her nude body. Um, and what she does is she plays with art historical narratives, so mm -hmm. she takes up um, the canon of art history, these images that we're very familiar with, um, a Da Vinci, a Monet, and she uses her body um, and poses her body as the subject of these works. It's all photographic based, but she also uses contemporary visual cues, visual uh, signs, like she's interested in hip hop and pop culture and advertising culture. She comes out of the world of fashion advertising. Okay. So she uses um, that language of fashion, of advertising, of pop culture, and she mixes it in with this art historical canon to, to reinterpret it. The, the great masters and to center black female body in these works. Um, and she also plays with titles, like she, um, her series, um, there's a series where she poses herself as uh, Jesus Christ okay. um, in The Last Supper, but uh, you know, she calls it Yo Mama series. Um, uh, you know, and she does these other things where she's the reclining nude, but she calls it um, Baby Back, you know, okay. so she's using hip hop language right. or kind of pop culture language to play with um, the, the, the kind of the seriousness and the um, sobriety that we give to the art historical canon. You also write about the reaction mm -hmm. in terms of um, not just the art itself, in terms of kind of the, the conversation, in terms of what's happening with hip hop and the, the, the black ma female figure, but you also act, talk about the reaction when folks see the art. Can you talk to me a little bit about more about what you've noticed about the reaction and what's kind of been publicized with some of the media out there. So one of the arguments that I make in my book, Troubling Vision, and that's the title, is that um, I say that um, black bodies, black subjects, are always troubling to dominant visual culture. So there's always a debate about, um, and we can even just think about Barack Obama and many of the conversations that kind of emerge around him and his mm -hmm. look, or Michelle Obama, and um, how ethnic they are, how not ethnic they are. So there's this ongoing conversation that happens whenever there's a black body Body, um, in dominant visual culture. And so my, my book is looking at various inst instantiations of, um, of cultural 
productions of mm -hmm. images of films that um, um, call forth um, controversy and, and Renee Cox's work is one of those so when her work was um, displayed at the Brooklyn Museum in 2001 um, there was a large public outcry Rudolph Giuliani was threatening to put money from the Brooklyn Museum um, a national debate arose where she was our, um, she it's Renee Cox mm -hmm. the photographer um, was debating um, people from uh, the Catholic Defamation League so it, it became this large large conversation around whether she was being sacrilegious, but I say that for me, really, the base of the argument wasn't read, wasn't the kind of religious iconography, her play with religious iconography, right. nor was it how experimental her art was. It was the fact that she was posing a black female figure in the center of these debates, and and the and the troubling presence of that body in the middle of these debates that people want to avoid. So we're looking at it, and we can't avoid looking at it, but we also don't want to have that foot on conversation about what it means. Well, part of what you're also talking about is the reaction from the white male Christian dominant culture in terms of how can you replace something so iconic with me with something that I so don't see as that conversation. Well, part of what I say is that, yeah, it, so it is kind of the dominant voice, this kind of hegemonic voice that's talking around right. these issues. But I also say that many of her defenders, and these are black male critics, also showed um, they were tepid in their response. So, so people, art critics and those uh, who are like art enthusiasts would defend her right to mm -hmm. freedom of expression. But but they also would not necessarily embrace her figuration. Okay. So there was this um, the skepticism around what she was doing, even as they were defending her right to do what she was doing. And I say much of it also had to do with their discomfort around her just black female nudity and in, 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 in being centered in these conversations. One of the things I know is you teach several classes here. I know you're working in American Studies right now, and I know you use lots of multimedia, photography, film, images in class to kind of spark the conversation mm -hmm. and to have the conversation and we'll kind of have students kind of explore that. Can you talk to me what um, some of the conversations have been like in class for you around some of those kind of conversations, some of those teachings? Well, la la for example, I'll, I'll speak of a class I taught um, in the fall on um, American documentary expression. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we looked at various forms of documentary um, production. We looked at radio documentaries, which I, I'm actually a big fan of radio documentaries. Okay. Um, we looked at uh, still photography, um, and then we did some work with video and film mm -hmm. um, um, documentary production. We also look at, looked at um, forms of journalism and um, kind of li the literary novel that's mm -hmm. based in you know documentary tra traditions. Um, and at the end of the course, students were, um, the final project was that each student produced the documentary okay and so students chose various formats for producing their documentary and I worked with them as much as I could to help them choose the mode that was best for their subject matter because part of what I was saying is that each uh, depending on what you're 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 researching or what you're studying um, the 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 mode will reveal itself mm -hmm. so um, for example radio documentary works well in many cases where um, you want a level of intimacy and and anonymity you don't want to see the person but you want to hear the kind of intimate right. details you know obviously video and film documentary work well if you're doing more um, kind of eth ethnographic visually based um, studies mm -hmm. and so we, the students really got that you know right. and, and, and in the end they produced some really beautiful projects also mm -hmm. listen we're running out of time okay. I would love to have you back because I think these are fascinating conversations and I think I want to talk more about the classes that you're teaching and kind of your new book when it comes out in the oh, fall great I'd love to come back once I have the book to show you. We'd love to have you. <music> Joining me is Wendell E. Pritchett, Chancellor of Rutgers University Camden. Welcome, Chancellor. Thank you for having me. Um, 
You know, you just started in Camden this academic year. Yes. I want to welcome you officially to the Rutgers family. Thank you. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about how you're adjusting to Camden at this particular point? So, you know, I, I grew up and have lived in Philadelphia for most of my life, and I have a lot of friends in Camden. I had a lot of friends at Rutgers University in Camden. So, while I've, I've only been there for 10 months, it doesn't really feel like I'm that new. Okay. Um, I, I felt very comfortable in the area, and again, with the, with the university, I have friends at the law school, friends in the history department, knew a lot about the city. Um, so, I felt like I was getting off to a very quick start and, and it, it, while I've been there 10 months it feels like a little bit longer actually it's, I think we've gotten a lot done in the last 10 months good I'm glad to hear that um, you mentioned Philadelphia well one of the things that our viewers probably need to know is that you were chief of staff uh, deputy chief of staff. De deputy chief of staff excuse me for the mayor um, uh, in Philadelphia and you had done a lot of civic work in, in Philadelphia can you give us a little bit about your background and kind of what you did in Philly sure so I, I grew up in Philadelphia as I mentioned uh, went away to college came back and I worked for a congressman from Philadelphia passed away recently uh, I went to law school I came back to Philadelphia mm -hmm. worked for a law firm uh, worked for a lot of nonprofits that were building affordable housing in the region uh, then I decided I wanted to become an academic went back to graduate school that time I stayed in Philadelphia I uh, got my degree at University of Pennsylvania um, and I taught for five years at uh, Baruch College which is part of the City University of New York mm -hmm. uh, which is a very similar place to Rutgers University Camden actually um, and then I, I spent last nine years working at University of Pennsylvania Law School um, and during that time in addition to teaching I, I did a lot of uh, advocacy work and activism in the city of Philadelphia and includes, including working on Mayor Nutter's campaign and that's how I got to know him um, and he asked me to, to help him get off to a good start in 2008 and so I was his deputy chief of staff and director of policy um, and uh, that was one of many things that uh, I've been doing over the last decade. Your biography is really rich in terms of civic engagement. Your biography is fairly rich in terms of also being in urban areas, from Philadelphia to New York City, now Camden. Um, can you tell me how you're kind of how you kind of see Camden in terms of that civic engagement with Rutgers Camden? Yeah, well, the main one of the main reasons I was excited about the job was the opportunity to to help run uh, a major institution that's an anchor in that city. Um, and uh, we've come to the understanding that institutions like universities and hospitals really are what shapes urban areas mm -hmm. uh, and, and for a lot of reasons the main reason is because they don't leave uh, businesses often pick up and leave and, right. and anchor institutions don't usually um, so one of the things that excited me about the job was the ability to run an institution that is engaged deeply with the city of Camden and Rutgers has been for decades it's not like this is a new thing that I'm bringing to to Rutgers but I was excited about the the opportunity to accelerate that so uh, we're doing a lot of work with the public schools in the city of Camden mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of work in capacity building with nonprofit organizations in the city of Camden and um, we're doing work with small businesses, uh, particularly in, tr in terms of contracting, trying to use our resources as much as possible to, to um, you know, purchase services and, and goods from businesses in the city of Camden okay. so that they can grow. Those are the kind of things that we're focused on. So it's really a Camden first kind of context in terms of business. Yeah, but Camden and the region. I mean, okay. certainly uh, our commitments are to South Jersey. Um, and in fact, in terms of business, we, we have a goal for purchasing in the city of Camden, but then we also have a, a goal for purchasing in Camden County, which is much larger um, than, than the city. Well, when we talk about Camden, we, we, we um, often hear all these negative things about Camden and New Jersey. It's one of those things that folks look in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of violence. Um, can you tell us some of things that, you know, are really positive about Camden? Can I really have a conversation with our viewers about that, you know, that perception of Camden isn't all true? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd say is that we have a wonderful campus, and everybody that comes there says, you have a lovely campus. It's a really terrific place. Um, and we're in the center of Camden. So one of the great things about Camden right. is us. Um, and, and we have a wonderful educational institution that really trains people for whatever they want to do in life. Um, and I, I, the first way I'd respond to your question is that we, I don't think we ever have anybody that say, I'd love to come to your, to your university, but I can't because of Camden. People okay. don't say that. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a safe campus, we have a really a lovely campus, and we have terrific faculty, and that's the most important thing mm -hmm. for any, any university. Uh, the city of Camden has troubles, like most cities do. Um, you know, there, there is poverty there, there are social problems, there, there is violence in other parts of the city of Camden, um, but there are wonderful institutions. There's us, there's Cooper Hospital, there's Lady of Lords Hospital. Campbell Soup is, is still a major presence in the city of Camden. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a wonderful waterfront. Um, uh, there are wonderful people in the city of Camden who are deeply engaged in trying to help the city come back. So there are just many, many assets to the city of Camden. Great. Um, one of the things I would like to talk to you a little bit about, and well, 
don't know yet, is the conversation about what are your plans for Rutgers Camden. Yeah. Um, you've been there for 10 months. Yeah. Um, I think you've probably had a chance to learn a great deal. Yeah. I know you started some new initiatives, so can you kind of talk to us about what your vision is for Rutgers Camden and kind of what you want to do over the next few years? Right. So we have three major goals. Uh, the first one is to grow the number of students. We're at 6,100 students right now, which is the largest our campus has ever been, mm -hmm. and our goal is to get to 7,500 students in the next five years. Okay. We have the, the capacity to serve more students than we do right now. Um, we, we have a wonderful faculty that is really engaged in teaching students and helping them achieve their goals. Um, and we really think that we're going to become a destination of choice in, in, even more than we are right now. Um, and our numbers are going up. We're, we're, I knock wood whenever I say this, but I think our trend is very positive for, for next fall. So our, our number one goal is to grow the number of students. We think we can serve more than we do and, and provide them with a really good education. Um, the second goal that we have is to enhance and deepen our current uh, academic programs. Mm -hmm. So over the last five years, we created new, three new PhD programs. One's in computational and integrative biology, one's in childhood studies, and one's in public affairs. And they're all interdisciplinary programs that bring together different departments that focus on new areas of study. Um, and we're very excited about them. We've drawn a lot of good PhD students and a lot of good master's students. And through those programs, we're going to increase the number of faculty we have and increase our connection to South Jersey. So that's number two. Okay. Um, and number three is something we've already been talking about, is, is continuing, to, continuing to engage with the city of Camden and the region. So we've hired a new director of civic engagement who's going to be my point person on connecting to the city and the region, working with nonprofits, working with the schools, working with government and business leaders to connect our faculty, staff, and students and alums to opportunities in the city and the region. So the way I like to describe it is we want to make the whole larger than the sum of its parts. Right. We're doing lots of things right now, but we're, we're, we're trying to you know, create syner synergies among the different activities so that we can really see some significant benefits. So those are our three goals over the next five years. Well, let's start on the enrollment part, because I think that's a really important part, and it's a great goal in terms of Cam Rutgers Camden. You have great relationships with the community colleges yeah. in South Jersey. Yeah. Probably your tightest relationship is with Camden County. Yes. It's right next door. Yeah. So talk to us about how you're kind of going to strengthen those relationships with those community colleges. I mean, they're already strong, yeah. but, but increasing you know, that kind of enrollment is really about progressing those relationships, too. That's right. So our, our goals in terms of enrollment are several-fold, but, but one of them, obviously, is transfer students. But I would mention we're particularly focused on increasing the number of freshmen that we okay. admit to the to the um, university but your question was about community colleges. So I meet with the president of Camden County Community College at least every other month. Um, I also meet with the presidents of the other county colleges. And what we talk about is how can we make that transition as seamless as possible? Right. Right? How can we make it as smooth as possible? And we've actually created a new office of new students uh, to increase that transition. Okay. Right? So in fact, the office of new students goes to the county colleges and meets with our students before they actually come. Right? So for example, right now, they're over in Camden County meeting with the students who will be starting on our campus in September. Okay. To say, these are the things that you need to be thinking about over the summer to, to be ready. To make sure that they've taken all the courses that they, they need to take. To make sure that they've gotten all the testing that they need to have. To talk about things like financial aid. Mm -hmm. So we want the transition to be as seamless as possible. Uh, the county colleges across the state, but certainly in South Jersey, are bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really want to make sure that we have a good connection with those students as early as possible. And we know they're coming, as you, as you right. said. This was, was the premise of your question. They want to come to us next. Um, so so we're, we're really focused on making that transition very easy. Um, and the president and I, obviously, we talk, but most of the work is done at different levels than right. that. So we set the, the framework, and then our staffs really work very well together. But let me just uh, conclude by adding, we really are actually even more focused on increasing the number of students we have as freshmen, because uh, they really create the culture. You know, they're the people that are going to be around for four years and mm -hmm. really create a, create a strong academic and social culture. And so we're really interested in them also. Okay. Um, you talked about the academic programs, um, you talked about the three new PhD programs, but can you talk about the richness of your undergraduate programs and your master's programs a little bit for us? Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing about the PhD programs is that they've actually had a very positive impact on the undergraduate programs. Sometimes there's a, there's a tension there, right, right. The, between teaching PhD students and teaching undergrads, but in fact, the Childhood Studies program is a perfect example. We started it as a PhD program. There are approximately 15 PhD students, but there's 60 master's students in Childhood Studies. Many of them are teachers who wanted to go back and get, get a master's in something, usually if you're a teacher, if you're an English teacher, you get a master's in English or you get a master's in history. But these are people that were interested in the interdisciplinary aspect. So they said, well, let me get a master's in childhood studies. Um, and they're really getting 
bits and pieces of lots of things. We also have extremely large undergraduate program in childhood studies, um, which and also suffer, many of them are in our teacher preparation program. They're interested in becoming teachers, and they're interested in, look, in looking at childhood development from a lot of different approaches. Um, so uh, that's a perfect example of how we're trying to connect the PhD programs to the undergrad experience. But historically, we were an undergrad institution, um, and that still is our focus. And really, what we're, we're so proud of is that we have faculty who really like teaching undergrads, who like working with them as researchers, who know their, the students' names and are really connected to them. We had admitted students stay last week where we were talking to the students who might be considering coming. And we had a wonderful panel of four undergraduate students, and they talked about their experiences. And you know, I talked for a couple of minutes, and I realized that I should shut up and let them talk, because they're the greatest sale, right? right. The students talking to other students about how great their experience has been. Uh, and I think that's probably the thing we're most proud of. In the state of New Jersey right now, we're dealing with some major budget concerns. We're probably looking at budget concerns over the next two or three years. Hopefully we're, you know, it's not going to affect us that much, but it's going to affect us. Mm -hmm. um, when you're thinking about your goals, and you're thinking about kind of what you've set the framework for at Rutgers Camden, how is the budget potentially going to impact that, or how is the budget going to challenge some of those areas? Yeah. Uh, well, we're growing, and that's exciting. It's good to be growing in periods of economic turmoil because at least we have resources that we have some flexibility in using. Right. So that's one of the things why we're, one of the reasons why we're focused on growing the enrollment. However, the answer to your question is we're going to need to be more efficient. We're going to need to figure out how do we use our existing resources even better or re reduce resources. So, for example, we're going to have to figure out how do we use our existing classrooms even more efficiently. How do we get s more students into those classrooms with this, as good an experience, but maybe having class a little earlier or having class go a little later, having class, more classes on Friday, having classes on Saturday. Okay. Um, how do we uh, have staff, you know, between different departments, registrar's office, financial aid, admissions, work together more mm -hmm. closely so that, you know, we kn I know they're all so busy, but how can they help each other out and at least, right. you know, relieve some of the stresses that we would have relieved by hiring more people or at least by retaining some people. Um, so we're going to have to be more efficient. Um, I think I have a pretty hard working staff already, but we're going to have to work even harder and I think we realize that. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. What I want to do is invite our viewers to really do visit Rutgers Camden. It's a great campus. It's in the heart of Camden, and I know that they would love to see you. Yes, so, we would. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Breakfast at the Barracks. For more information about any of the subjects we've discussed here today, please visit our website at Rutgers.tv. For all of us at the Divi Rutgers Division of Continuing Studies, I'm Bill Leopold, and thanks for watching.